Welcome to the ScanSource Quarterly Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. Today's call is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Mary Gentry, Vice President, Treasurer, and Investor Relations. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you, and welcome to ScanSource's Earnings Conference Call for the quarter ended December 31, 2019. Our call will include prepared remarks from Mike Bauer, our Chairman and CEO, and Jerry Lyons, our CFO. John Eld, our Chief Revenue Officer, is also joining us. We will review our operating results for the quarter and then take your questions. We posted a CFO commentary that accompanies our comments and webcasts in the Investor Relations section of our website. Certain statements made on this call, including our expectations for sales, operating performance, earnings, fair value of contingent consideration, operating cash flow, tax rates, interest expense, planned divestitures, and results for the third and fourth quarters of fiscal year 2020 are forward-looking statements. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from such statements. These risks and uncertainties include, but are not limited to, those factors identified in the earnings release that we put out today and in scan sources form 10K for the year ended June 30, 2019, as filed with the SEC. Any forward-looking statements represent our views only as of today and should not be relied upon as representing our views as of any subsequent date. ScanSource disclaims any duty to update any forward-looking statements to reflect actual results or changes in expectations except as required by law. During our call, we will discuss both GAAP and non-GAAP results and have provided reconciliations between these amounts in the CFO commentary and in our press release. These reconciliations can also be found on our website and have been filed with our Form 8K. I'll now turn the call over to Mike. Thanks, Mary, and thank you for joining us today. For the quarter, we missed our sales forecast primarily from lost sales as we reorganized our North American VAR sales team. As we discussed on prior calls, we are executing our one-scan source strategy. The goal of our one-scan source strategy is to increase customer value by cross-selling and growing recurring revenue. We are setting up our VAR sales teams to sell solutions, connectivity, cloud, and SaaS, including offerings from our IntelliSys and NT acquisitions. The strategy behind one scan source is to become customer-centric, provide more value, and enable growth for our customers. Beginning in April, we combined our five North American VAR business units into one. We reorganized our teams by customer segments, we changed customer assignments. We introduced team selling. We implemented Salesforce CRM. And we adopted a new sales compensation plan. With these changes and the realignment of our sales teams, we created customer disruption and negatively impacted our service levels. Since April, as we encountered issues, we made adjustments. And now, following this quarter's sales results, we will make more changes. During this quarter, we had another record quarter with the IntelliSys sales partners. This business grew 19% year over year, with the cloud suppliers growing even faster at 68%. One of our key objectives with IntelliSys has been to recruit and sell through more VARs while still growing the agent channel. To date, out of 4,000, approximately 4,000 IntelliSys sales partners, Approximately 15% are scan source of ours. Over a year ago, in order to accelerate the growth of the VAR sales channel, we started our Ignite program to identify and recruit VARs to join the IntelliSys sales community. The Ignite team is focused on the scan source strategic sales partners and working with the scan source account executives to introduce VARs to the financial benefit of recurring revenue. We've learned that VARs require education and a financial investment to participate successfully. As an example of a success so far, a longtime Barco strategic VAR recently won a multi-year contract to supply thousands of mobility devices and recurring revenue in the form of connectivity services. 
These services will be worth minimally $300,000 in recurring commissions each year to the VAR. The Ignite team is currently working with over 600 key accounts in the ScanSource VAR base. <clears throat> this gives us confidence to accelerate our efforts to integrate more closely by aligning with the one ScanSource strategy and creating a teaming approach. Now Jerry will take you through the financial results and our outlook for next quarter. Thanks, Mike. Net sales for our second quarter declined 5% year over year, principally from lower sales volumes in North America and higher than expected declines in our premise-based communications business. Because of the lower sales volumes, the GAAP diluted EPS and the non-GAAP diluted EPS fell below our forecasted range. In August, we announced plans to divest certain physical product businesses outside of the United States, Canada, and Brazil. These businesses had net sales of $156 million for our second quarter, and at December 31, 2019, had working capital of $167 million. A process is underway to sell these businesses, and based upon the interest we have received, we anticipate having an agreement by the end of the third quarter of our fiscal year 2020. Consolidated net sales for our second quarter totaled $990 million, down 5% year over year, and also down 5% on an organic basis. Foreign currency translation negatively impacted sales by approximately $7 million. Net sales for our worldwide barcoding, barcode networking and security segment declined 2% year over year or 0.4% on an organic basis. This reflected lower sales volumes in North America, partially offset by growth in mobile computing and in our payments business. Net sales for our worldwide communications and services segment declined 12% year over year or 14% on an organic basis primarily from significant headwinds in our premise-based communications business in North America. We also had a record quarter for Intellisys, where sales increased 19% year over year. We also added $11 million of SaaS sales from the Inti acquisition. Excluding the planned divestitures, non-GAAP gross profit dollars for the quarter decreased 5% year over year. Our second quarter fiscal year 2020 non-GAAP gross profit margin was 11.8%, down slightly from the year ago period of 11.9% and up from the prior period of 11.6%. SG&A expenses increased $2.2 million from the prior year quarter to $83 million for the second quarter fiscal year 2020. We have made investments for our recurring revenue and services-based businesses. Our investments also include the digital capabilities we've added with the acquisitions of Inti, RPM, and Cantango. Our second quarter fiscal year 2020 non-GAAP operating income was $28.6 million, or 3.4% of net sales, compared to $34.6 million, or 4% in the prior year quarter. We have a $45 million contingent consideration liability on our December 31, 2019 balance sheet, and this reflects the present value of expected future earnout payments for our IntelliSys acquisition. For second quarter fiscal year 2020, we recorded an expense for the increase in fair value of contingent consideration of $3.2 million for IntelliSys. For a third quarter fiscal year 2020 forecast, we estimate the change in fair value of contingent consideration to be an expense of approximately $1.9 million. For fiscal year 2020, we estimate the effective tax rate, excluding the planned divestitures, to range from 25 to 26 percent, excluding discrete items. Now turning to the balance sheet and to cash flow. We generated strong operating cash flow of $71 million for our second quarter and trailing 12-month operating cash flow of $143 million. We expect to generate positive operating cash flow during fiscal year 2020. Working capital investment declined 7% quarter over quarter and 8% year over year. 
The planned divestitures had approximately $167 million in working capital at December 31, 2019, down $37.5 million from the June 30, 2019 balance. With the completion of planned divestitures, we would expect to use those proceeds to pay down debt. At December 31, 2019, we had cash and cash equivalents of $42 million and debt of $358 million. Our net leverage totaled approximately 2.3 times trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA. ROIC was 9.9 for the second quarter fiscal year 2020. Since August 18, 2018, we have invested $81 million in our Campango RPM NT acquisitions that built strategic capabilities for recurring revenue but have not yet contributed to our EBITDA growth. Now turning to our forecast, we are providing our third quarter forecast excluding the planned divestitures. For the third quarter fiscal year 2020, we expect GAAP net sales to range from $865 million to $915 million and non-GAAP net sales, excluding the planned divestitures, to range from $725 million to $775 million. For the next two quarters, we are planning to see quarter-over-quarter quarter net sales growth in line with our historical seasonal trends. Historically, sales are down 10% quarter-over-quarter quarter for the March quarter and up 10% quarter-over-quarter quarter for the June quarter. For the full year, fiscal 20, year 2020, we expect annual sales growth of less than 1%. For our third quarter forecast, we expect GAAP diluted earnings per share to range from $0.16 cents to $0.26 cents per share, and non-GAAP diluted earnings per share to range from $0.44 cents to $0.54 cents per share. The GAAP EPS does not include any non-cash charges from write-downs or losses associated with the planned divestitures, as those cannot be reasonably estimated at this time. For the March quarter, we expect a gross profit close to 12% and a non-GAAP operating income margin below 3%. With the lower sales volume, we are not getting the SG&A leverage that we originally expected in our forecast for the year. For the fiscal year 2020, we expect our non-GAAP operating margin to be a little over 3% in line with our expected sales volumes. We are assuming approximately $3.3 million for interest expense in the third quarter, and we estimate the tax rate excluding planned divestitures to be in the range of 25 to 26% for fiscal year 2020, excluding discrete items. Now I'd like to turn the call back over to Mike for a closing comment. Thanks, Jerry. We are confident that completing our one-scan source go-to-market transformation to drive recurring revenue growth is the right strategy for our business. After we complete this transformation, we expect to be able to deliver fiscal year 2021 results that reflect our strategy, including moving ROIC above 10% and delivering double-digit non-GAAP earnings per share growth. We will now open it up for questions. Thank you. To ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Adam Tyndall with Raymond James. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. This is Madison on for Adam, and thanks for taking my questions. I wanted to start with some of the commentary around the North America sales reorganization and lost sales. Can you just talk about the timing, uh, the, the timing of the impact for this? Are you expecting it to be a continued headwind throughout the rest of the fiscal year? And then are you seeing any customer attrition related to this, or is it just a case of missed sales to those customers? Hey, Madison, this is Mike. So, as we said uh, in our prepared remarks, that we started this process in April, and as you um, heard on the call, we gave a little more color into all the different things we were doing since April, such as um, new Salesforce CRM system, different compensation plans, moving customers from one team to another. And what we learned was that that was a lot of moving pieces and we didn't see the impact of that until this past quarter from a negative perspective. 
now that we know what happened, and, and in certain cases we have customers that said, hey, I'm not happy with a new salesperson or sales team. I want somebody different or I'm going to go away. We had to make some adjustments, as we said. And in some cases, customers, especially when we think about the customers that maybe are in, um, that are that are not buying from us regularly, they decided to go somewhere else for now. What we believe is, in our for, and it's implied in our forecast for Q3, and what we indicated about Q4 seasonality is that we believe we should experience, and we're planning for a normal seasonal change from December. And that means normally we would go from December quarter to the March quarter and decline 10%. That's what we're forecasting. We then would say from March to June quarter, historically, we grow 10%. We're forecasting that or we're suggesting today that that would be what we are planning for. So we're planning to get through this, and uh, but yes, we've lost some customers. We believe we can get many of them back, but we know we have to make some changes quickly. Okay, that's really helpful, Caller. Uh, just to follow up here on, on cash flow, obviously a bright spot here in the first half. Uh, I know you kind of, you're sticking by the, the positive comment for the full year, um, but can you just help us level set expectations for the second half on cash flow? Do you expect that, uh, you know, the second half looking at it from a standalone perspective is going to be positive as well? Uh, I just don't want to get ahead of ourselves from a modeling standpoint there. No, I, Madison, this is Jerry. I, I think that that's right. We should expect it to be positive for the second half as well. <clears throat> you know, we um, obviously, uh, uh, you know, we had some working capital come down, which was good. Um, the volume coming down, which isn't a, a good thing, uh, but it drives cash flow for us. So, um, but we do expect, in short answer to your question, we do expect the second half to be positive. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions. Sure. You bet. No problem. Thank you. Our next question comes from Keith Usum with North Coast Research. Your line is now open. Good afternoon, guys. Hey, hey Mike, you know, you're referring to these changes you made in the North American VARs, uh, but you started that in April. What was what did it take so long for the ramifications to be felt? Why did it take three quarters to, to really see the impact of that? Sure. Well, part of what we decided to do was make sure that we made some adjustments as we saw some either deficiencies or gaps or things weren't working quite well. So we made some changes all along. And then what we learned was in some cases those changes weren't enough and a customer gave us the benefit of the doubt in the June quarter. They then in the September quarter may have said, okay, you guys don't get this fixed, whatever this is in their particular case, um, then we're going to go somewhere else. And when we gave our, our uh, forecast back in November, for the December quarter, we were looking at, at what we knew at that point in time, and we were looking at October's sales results. And they gave us confidence in November to still call the December number as we did. So we, we would say that in the, from the middle of November to the end of December is when it really became obvious. It was not obvious that we had a big sales disconnect, a volume disconnect until then. Okay. And, and that disconnect probably continued into the first quarter, and that's why your guidance for next quarter is probably below our expectations. Well, it's probably this, Keith. It's probably more like we took what happened in December, and we said, you know, in any other December quarter, it's always going to be down in the March quarter. So we're really looking at the December as the guide, not what we do a year ago. It's what we do in December, and let's forecast that it's going to be less than that because that's just historic. If we don't, you know, if we have the business we had in December, this is what we expect to do. Obviously, we'd like to do better, and if we mm-hmm. win customers back rateably, it will uh, it will do better on our forecast. Okay. And you mentioned that you have more changes to make. What gives you confidence that the changes that you make are going to win back these customers? Well, we obviously have talked to a lot of them. And we talk to our sales teams, and we believe that these are self-inflicted. And, and, you know, an example is we just made some customers mad because we took their sales rep and maybe promoted their rep because they were really good to another team because we thought they could provide the company more value. And that disconnect with their rep is not something that you can easily replace. So it's going to take 
probably a visit by an executive, if we value that customer, go sit down and talk to them and say, hey, we're going to put a new team in place. We can't bring Johnny back, but we got Sally and this team, and here's why they can help you better. So this is going to be more blocking and tackling. And what we did in the design, and we've tried not to disclose all the details for, our, for competitive reasons, but as an example, we now have a large group of account executives that we didn't have before prior to April. Account executives essentially are a field sales team. We didn't have that for these customers. So we believe the new structure will allay, enable us to go have those conversations and win back the business. Okay. If I can just squeeze one more in here, and I'm going to change gears on you. I, I know we're very early in the coronavirus, uh, but obviously we're hearing rumblings about supply chains and potential disruption. Uh, I guess what, you're here, what are you hearing from vendors right now and perhaps customers in terms of how they're thinking about the supply chain impact for if this gets any worse? Well, we, uh, we sent a uh, message out to our teams to give us an update, and based on what we've heard so far, there are some potential minimal disruptions. Some of the vendors are saying they don't have their workers returning to the factory following the new year yet, that there might be a one- or two-week disruption is kind of what we're hearing. If we heard anything that was like no problem, it was one- or two-weeks, Keith, in a supply chain scenario. Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Our next question comes from Chris McGinnis with Fidelity Company. Your line is now open. Good yeah, afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit around around the cloud services you're offering. You, you talked about one of the headwinds being an investment by them, um, by the VARs. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about what that investment is and how you're getting them over that, that hump? Yeah, sure, Chris. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, we, we created this Ignite team and put together a, uh, a strategy and a blueprint and a playbook that we designed so that our team would go sit down with the VARS principals, the CFO and either the president, CFO, owner, and sit down and say, here's, here's how this works. To add recurring revenue to a traditional hardware VAR means that you're going to have to invest in salespeople in selling processes that you won't get a return on for three years. That, that is the typical return by making an investment in recurring revenue. Once you get to three years, man, you start printing money, but that's the financial investment. We walk them through that investment, and we try to help them, you know, minimize it and take some risk out, but that's what we mean by financial investment. This is why it's not easy. It's why it takes longer than everybody realizes, but once you get it going, it's a fantastic way to move your business from a hardware business that has a value to a recurring revenue and hardware business that has a much higher um, valuation, which gives the owners a better exit path one day. And that's our pitch. If you want to have a more valuable business, you must do this, and we can help you. Okay. Thanks for that. And then that is lastly in terms of, you know, the guidance you provided for Q2 versus, you know, where you came in. I know you said a lot of that was obviously the, the change in Salesforce, but if, you know, can you just maybe talk a little bit about the end market demand with the communications and, and just was there an escalation from the trend you're seeing from Q1 to Q2? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, We so we would say for the miss last quarter, um, this quarter, about two-thirds was our own Salesforce reorganization, and a third was continued decline from premise to cloud. And that did accelerate more than we had forecasted. So I would say, yes, there definitely is still a, a steeper curve happening than we had forecast um, back in November. So we do believe in this quarter we also are forecasting that. And we're starting to, as we model out, you know, the rest of the year from a planned investment, we clearly are making sure we're moving some of those investments where it makes sense away from a premise-based uh, strategy towards a cloud-based strategy. So we will be doing that reallocation of resources from the cloud to the cloud from the premise business. Okay. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Uh, good luck. You you Thank you. Thank you. I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to Mike Bauer for any closing remarks. 
Thank you for joining us today. We expect to hold our next conference call to discuss March 31st quarterly results on Monday, May 11th, 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.